Hey, in this video, we're going to take a look at how to trigger an AppSync subscription from some sort of backend process. Uh, in particular, it, what we're going to do is um, have an event bridge event trigger some sort of process which updates or removes something in a database. And then that operation will then trigger a subscription letting a front end know that a change has been made. To demonstrate all this, I have two apps. The first one is a store inventory app where you can add items to uh, to your inventory at your store. The second app is you can imagine like a TV that's, that shows up at Starbucks or whatever that's showing the products they're promoting behind the cashier. Um, so if I add an item to this, we're gonna see that uh, reflected here. Now, the unique thing about the situation is that this app has its own backend, uh, which has like an app sync uh, API in front of it. This is a completely separate service. Uh, it has a completely separate backend with its own database, its own API, uh, app sync API. Um, and so when something happens here, we're going to emit an event and this is going to pick up on that event, do some things on its end, and then let this front end know that a change has been made. So that's the unique part about this project. And uh, for, for teams that have lots of microservices, this is perhaps something they'd be interested to know how, how to achieve. So let's take a look at the code. Oh, I should mention too, uh, we have different stores here. So this is just to show that um, these subscriptions are listening on different different stores. Okay, so let's take a look at um, what the code looks like. We have a backend inventory, a back end menu, a front inventory and a front menu. So these are the both the back and front end of each service. And then we also have a back shared. So this is going to contain some of the shared resources that um, all of our theoretical microservices are gonna be using. Um, so let's take a look at the uh, inventory, which is this right here, the inventory backend first. Another thing I try to do in this project is to use Lambda as little as possible and uh, try to lean on just uh, you know um, CloudFormation resources. So uh, so that kind of makes it a little bit this project a little bit unique as well. Um, so we'll see how how we were able to do this with only two Lambda functions. First of all. We define a database here, DynamoDB database. We got an app sync uh, API defined. We got a schema defined. If you're wondering how this is possible, it's all about this symbol right here. If I didn't do that, it would try to parse this as YAML. And obviously this is not valid YAML, but if I do this, then it's just gonna parse it as a string. So that's kind of what allows me to to only have this single file and, and write everything in, in it uh, versus having like a separate schema.graphql. Um, and what wh which do you do? Uh, do you write a scheme, a separate file or inline it like this? It totally is contextual. In this scenario, it's, it's uh, such a small amount that I just inlined it. Um, we have some data sources too. We got a DynamoDB data source, which represents it's a data source that represents this guy here. Then we got a Lambda data source. We'll come back to what this is all about in a bit. Then we got our permissions. FYI, if you're going to write CloudFormation like this without serverless or framework or SAM framework, you're gonna spend half your time writing permissions. That's just, um, that's one of the things that uh, these serverless frameworks sort of help you with and abstract away from you. But if you're just gonna write CloudFormation, be prepared to write a lot of permissions. Um, so that's what uh, all these guys are. So next we have resolvers. Uh, so we could connect each um, operation to a Lambda function, but uh, if we're just doing CRUD, if we're just doing simple CRUD operations, we could just use VTL. and. Uh, VTL is, you know, people have strong opinions about it. I would say once you get used to it, this is not a whole lot of code. Like this is not a whole lot of lines of code. Um, it would probably be more effort for me to write a Lambda function than to do this for like a simple, you know, query my database. So, um, so yeah, if you're, if, if uh, VTL is um, kind of scares you, I would just recommend spending a bit of time learning it 
because once you learn it, it's not too bad for simple things. So if you're going to do complex things, then it's worth using a Lambda. But for simple CRUD operations, VTL is really nice. Uh, for the resolver function, this one's a little bit more to it. Um, when we look at this, it's only doing one thing, get me things from a database. But here, what we're going to want to do is write state to a database and emit an event, so two things. So what we're going to do is make a pipeline resolver. Pipeline resolvers is basically a way of doing uh, more than one thing and combining them together. So, um, so this is one thing. I am doing two things, fitting them into a pipeline resolver here. So we got write state pipeline function, emit event. In the remove, we have remove state and then emit event. And these are things that I've defined right down here. So this is the write, write, uh, write state, which is basically a DynamoDB operation. This is remove state and then ev emit event. This is going to uh, trigger a Lambda function one of our two Lambda functions in this project. And then we got some outputs. Okay, so what is this Lambda function? And we are representing that Lambda function in our AppSync app with this data source here. Well, let's move to the back shared. In the back shared, I am actually using the SAM framework here because I want to use a layer and we'll get to why we're using a layer later on. So we'll skip that for now. Um, we set up an event bridge. We put this in shared because if we have like 10 microservices, we're just going to, all 10 microservices are going to use the same event bridge and we're going to emit events to it and listen to events on this one event bridge, uh, event bus. And this is our function that's going to facilitate uh, emitting events. And I inline this Lambda function here because it's not a whole lot of code. So what we're going to do is bring, uh, initialize the event bridge and um, just uh, put an event onto it. So the idea here is like you could easily write Lambda functions in your own services and do this. In a um, but if we want to just write events to this single uh, event bus and we want to try to minimize the amount of Lambda functions that we're writing. We could just make a super generic function that all, all of our services share. So what we've done here is we've outputted, uh, made an output based on, on that Lambda function, outputting the ARN, and we gave the ex export value this value here. And then in our first uh, template, we're using this import value confirmation function to reference that. And so that's how this data source is referencing that um, Lambda function that's defined in a different template. Um, I find like uh, you don't want to do too much uh, reference things from other templates. Uh, like if, if everybody's referencing other things, it can get really unorganized and complicated. I would say if, uh, if people are going to reference other things, let it be a shared like a, a specifically labeled shared resources. That way, everybody's everybody's referencing um, external things in a single spot. So it's a little bit more organized and um, less complicated that way. Okay, so, and then of course, we got our Lambda function um, permissions for that. Great, now let's go to our back menu. And um, we're almost at the point where we can talk about that particular mechanism of listening to an event bridge event and triggering a subscription. So first of all, we got a DynamoDB database. We got um, our AppSync API and schema defined. The schema is a little bit more to it because we're doing a subscription. So we'll talk more detail about what's going on here in a bit. We got um, some data sources here. We got a DynamoDB data source with all of its permissions. We got a none data source, which we'll talk about in a second. We got a resolver that just has some VTL to get things from the database. Then we got an update resolver, and this one's a little bit unique, and we'll come back to that in a second. Okay, so here is where we pick up from that um, that workflow. So we create or remove something in an inventory service. It emits an event. 
in the shared resources is where we the, all those the event stuff is defined, the event bridge and the function that helps us put events onto the event bridge, event bus. Now here is where we define um, what to do when a specific event happens. So we're not going to respond to every event. We're going to respond to events coming from AppSync Copy Shop Admin, in particular the product updated event type. If that happens, we're interested in it, and so we're going to trigger something in response to those events. In this case, we're going to trigger a workflow, and then here, of course, the um, obligatory uh, permissions right here. <laughs> and so what we're going to trigger is the is a state machine, a step function. So again, we could easily do a Lambda function here, but um, step functions are nice in that they're, uh, well, there's, there's all kinds, kinds of reasons why step functions are nice. But in our scenario, um, we were trying to only write Lambda functions for custom logic and use VTL or state machines to uh, to deal with just common stuff like CRUD operations in the case of VTL or in the case of step functions, just like common, um, uh, I don't know how, what the right term is, like just like a control flow, I suppose. So. Uh, in this case, what happens is when that event comes in, we're first going to, we say, what's our starting state, choice state. Is it uh, a create or a move? Because it can be two different types of things. If it's create, uh, go to the create step. If it's remove, go to remove step. If we go to the create step here. We can uh, simply put an event or, or put an item into our database, similar to what our VTL is doing in our other scenarios. Um, and if it's a remove, we're going to remove something from the database. And then when either of these are done, we're going to go to this next state, which is trigger subscription. And so this is the second Lambda function, the second bit of custom logic that we need to accomplish here. So here we are. This is the point of this whole project. How do we trigger a subscription from the backend? Well, let's take a look at how subscriptions work uh, in AppSync, first of all. They need to respond to a mutation. That is how they work. So if something happens on the front end and we trigger a mutation, this is quite an easy thing. But if something in the back end happens, we still need to go through that mutation um, workflow. And so it's like we need to call ourselves. We need to call our own API. But we want to make sure that only we can call this. We, we don't want anybody to trigger this mutation. So this is why we have a second authentication provider. So API key, it's what we're using for our front end. For the back end, we're gonna use AWS IAM. Uh, IAM is super nice because you can basically define an IAM role. It's basically, if something has permissions to call the AppSync um, API defined in some sort of IAM permission, then it's able to do it. Otherwise, it, it's not. <clears throat> so you can be super tight in your and what you will allow using this method. And then uh, what we can do is add this right here. So if I just didn't put anything here, it's just gonna take the, the default um, uh, permission type or authentication type. If I want it to be the additional one, I need to give it you know this, uh, this right here. So uh, what I'm saying here is that this update, only people with IAM permissions are able to do this. If you have an API key, that's not good enough. You need one of these. So that's great. So the next question is, well, how do I call this API with these permissions? That's that's kind of the tricky part. Um, and so let's talk about, about that. So below this, oh, um, we got our state machine and then we got our uh, IAM roles, of course. Uh, then we have our second Lambda function. I inlined it here. This is probably too much code to inline. Um, uh, this, it's at this point that I perhaps would then use a SAM framework or a serverless framework. Um, but right here, we're just inlining it. So what I'm doing here is um, I'm going to get everything from a DynamoDB table. Basically, I'm going to relist. I'm going to I'm going to um, get the list of all the new record, all the new items and send it over to the front end. But what I need to do is call this mutation with a signed um, request. 
how do you sign a request? Well, first of all, you need to give it permission. So our Lambda role, we have a bunch of permissions here. In particular, we got this one here. We're gonna say this Lambda can um, perform this mutation here. So now we need to embed that those permissions into a uh, request, a signed request. This is a little bit of uh, a little bit of work that is something you don't want to repeat in every lambda function. This is exactly why we made a layer in a, in our shared resources because making signed requests it's one of those things. If you had ten services, perhaps all ten of them are going to want to do this thing, and um, it's such a generic sort of bit of functionality. May as well just make it available inside of a layer rather than rewriting it in every service. So uh, let's jump back to our shared resources and let's return to this spot here. This is the coffee shop layer. Let's look at our layer code. Uh, this is this is basically it. So it's going to take the um, it's going to take the permissions given to the Lambda function that this is called in. We're going to make a signed um, AppSync request uh, query. Um, so we're going to use the AWS signer. Um, and then we're going to uh, use node fetch. So uh, if you want to look further into this, um, go ahead. But that's basically what it does. We're signing, we're signing the request, M making a request, signing it. Um, and uh, basically adding headers, the correct headers to it, so that when we do call this AppSync API, it's going to recognize um, recognize these permissions. But this is the sort of thing you don't want to rewrite over and over again. You just want to make this a nice utility function that can be used in all of your functions. So make signed a AppSync request. Let's go back to here. We are um, we are using that. Right here, we're referencing our lambda layer, and I'm a I'm assigning this lambda layer to this lambda function like so. Okay, so we got the signed thing out of the way. So basically, what I'm doing is I'm making this query. Um, sorry, this mutation call against the endpoint, and it's going to be signed with IM permissions. So now, let's take a look at what happens. We call this mutation. This subscription is listening to that mutation. It's going to, the PK is represented about the store ID. So we're gonna say, which one are we interested in listening to? And every time we call this mutation with, with the uh, updated list of inventory items, it's going to fire the subscription. And on the front end, if they're listening for that specific store ID, they're gonna get that subscription coming in and they'll update uh, their front end. So there you go, that, oh, and then uh, I guess the last thing uh, to mention as well that we kind of skipped over before was this none data source. Where is it? Right here. This is simply to, um, like a mutation needs to be attached to a data source and really this is a pass through. Like whatever we put into this update, we're going to, we want it to boomerang back out uh, on the up, on update subscription. So there's there's nothing no nothing I want to do in between those two steps. You certainly could do something there, but in this scenario we just uh, created a none data source or basically a pass through data source. Um, so there you go. That's uh, a quick look at how you can trigger an AppSync subscription from a backend process. Uh, admittedly, it's a lot of steps. It's a lot of stuff, which is exactly why. Um, I think it's a good idea to create like a layer for this so that you don't, you can, you just figure it out once and then you just use it going forward. Um, abstracting these sorts of things, these really common things is really nice because if it's, if it's going to be super like tedious and difficult to do this thing, then it's possible that you just won't, you'll try to figure out some other way of doing it. But um, if you can make really nice abstractions over top of this and, and it create like a common workflow, then uh, it, it becomes easier. So, um, so yeah, so I figured I would make this, this example as a reference for people if they wanted to, to see how this is done and um, sort of adapt it to your scenario.